Um, our next speaker is a visiting researcher scholar at the University of Texas. She was the co-founder of Moktu, um, Moktu Mona, the first um, Bengali-speaking platform for three thinkers, free thinkers. Bonia Ahmad represents the history of resistance, history of the undefeated in Bangladesh and Bengali-speaking communities. Let's give her a warm welcome today to this conference, Bonia Ahmed. Am I supposed to do something here? It's, it's there we go. Good morning. Um, wow, what a lovely crowd. I have to I have to say lovely somewhere. This is London, right? So there we go. Uh, thank you, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, thanks to the organizers of this conference. Uh, what a great achievement. Thank you, Mariam. Um, for, uh, for organizing this. I will start um, today's, this is actually an honor to start um, the conference. Uh, and the title of this conference is, is actually pretty amazing. It's not just freedom of expression or thought, it also talks about conscience. I really, thought about it. You know, the notion of freedom changes with time and space. At this moment, I think our species is standing in a crossroad of history, where individual liberty, freedom of expression, conscience, and belief have become a very important part of our existence. We are demanding equal rights, regardless of sex, gender, class, ras race, you name it. We, the secular community, are demanding freedom for all, which is the greatest demand of our life, of our time. To me, the most problematic aspect of religion is not all those discriminating rules ingrained in it. We hear those rules all the time. The Bible commands Christians to kill homosexuals. Islam allows men to marry four women. Uh, or, uh, you know, rape war, criminal, war prisoners. You can kill the apostates. The Hindu religion says women are worse than cows. But I accept these rules from a historical perspective, that these rules and notions might have been more acceptable in a specific time and space. I think what is more problematic in religion is that especially in today's world, the demand of the world religions that those rules defined in the scriptures are never to be changed or challenged. They're fixed for eternity. They are expected to be applied to all societies at all times as part of a divine order. But if there is anything fixed in this world, it is that our universe, our planet, and every life form in this world is continuously changing. Our culture, language, society, consciousness, values, all change. So when religious religions claim that their imposed rules and moral demands will be or should be applicable regardless of time and place, they contradict with the basic nature of our universe. Why do we desire freedom of expression? Why do we desire liberty? Because we crave the right to question everything. Those, this seems to be a relatively new demand. This desire to question everything actually comes from our innate ability to be curious. If you look closely, quite ironically, even religion itself stemmed from this basic human curiosity. And this curiosity has played a critical role in our sex success as a species and in dominating this planet. It seems that religion is also in contradiction with this basic human nature 
our curiosity, our desire to question everything. Another problem with religion is its claim to the ultimate truth. It's not only that it's untestable, it is extremely divisible. My God is the only true God. You are a sinner if you do not believe in my God. I can kill you if you try to live my God. I have lived through it. Before polytheistic religion, before that, the polytheistic religions did not claim that their gods were the only gods. My God could be stronger than yours, but this is not the only God. These gods, our gods, are not necessarily the only one everybody has to follow. It is fasc fascinating to think about how monotheism is the first religious system that created this unresolvable unresolv divisiveness which has in incited hatred, violence, war, all through history. We, the secular community, are on the right side of history because we demand these fundamental rights for humanity according to the conscience of our time. We want equal rights, the freedom of expression, and freedom, of freedom, freedom to believe or not to believe because we believe that anything can be questioned, challenged, and tested. With that in mind, I would also like to take us to task today. If we claim that our secular community is structured around rational and scientific thinking, we should continuously evaluate and reevaluate ourselves. With that, I would like to address a few things that I think can be improved, changed, or better understood from our side. I think we often fail to see the broader picture of religion in our societies. Sometimes we are too simplistic or superficial in our criticism of religion. We forget that religion is a very complex phenomena, tightly ingrained with the evolution of our culture, society, politics, and economic systems. I think we need to understand religion better. Today, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that complexity of religion, which has been immensely successful all through our history, cannot be understood only through the lens of religious doctrines. Why do the vast majority of human beings subscribe to religion? What is in religion that makes it so versatile, that resonates with so many human minds? Why must we understand the cultural, social, psychological, evolutionary, or even the spiritual basis of it? If we look carefully, we will see that the most of today's religions were designed with an incredible ability to adapt and evolve. And afterwards, as political systems evolved in our societies, over thousands of years, so did religion. Our ability to create culture has been critical to the success of our species in this planet. And religion is a big part of our culture. Religion has successfully sustained itself and evolved regardless of all the irra irrationality ingrained in it. Didn't we predict that as the world would become more educated and scientific-minded, religion would die out? We have seen the success in, of this hypothesis in Europe, mainly in Northern, Northern Europe. Religion is becoming more and more irrelevant to, the daily li to our everyday life. But what happened in the US? The epitome of wealth, education, scientific discoveries in the 20th century, right? What happened to the rest of the world in South America, in the Muslim world? Why did our hypothesis that religion would be less relevant as society would progress fail? Maybe the scripts of secularism that we wrote during the time of enlightenment need to be reevaluated. Maybe our hypothesis derived from Western moder modernity and enlightenment was not inclusive enough. Maybe religion has flourished in these regions even as the world became more educated and scientific because many of these parts of the world experienced a completely different history from Europe. 
back to the 15th, 16th, 17th century, back when capitalism was flourishing in Europe, when Europe was talking about individual liberty and freedom of religion, India was being colonized by the British Empire. The religious identity politics among Hindus and Muslims were being actively promoted for the first time. On the other side of the world, Europeans were massacring and converting Native Americans in the name of Christianity. Though Europe preached individual liberties, the international slave trade was at its height. So if we try to apply the same notions of liberty derived from the, this modernity and enlightenment, the enlightenment notion, it might not work quite the same way in the other parts of the world. They had a very different history, very different growth and development. They didn't have the organic growth they could have had for the last few centuries. Unfortunately, I do not have a silver bullet. I do not know what, what will work, might work. But I'm pretty sure that simply cutting and pasting what we have learned from Western enlightenment will not work in many societies around the world. So we must look deeper. We must take a different angle and investigate local religious conflicts in relation to global influences in order to understand and combat the modern rise of religious fundamentalism and radicalism. Let me give you a, an example of why this hypothesis about religion are and might not be always copy-pastable. We often make comments about the hijab, Muslim women wearing hijabs. We correctly point out that hijab is rooted in the patriarchal origin of Islam. We are right about that. Like most other religions, in order, to, in order to subjugate women. But now the question is, who is to be held accountable? Let me tell you what is happening in Bangladesh. It's a country with 90% Muslim population. Wearing a hijab was not that common when I was growing up in Bangladesh in the 70s or 80s. And as you can predict now, yes, it has become very common. One has to ask the question, why and how did that happen? The easy answer would be that Bangladesh has become more religiously orthodox. Yes, it is right. But the question is, does that completely answer the question? I think there is more to the story. I have talked to a, quite a few female workers in Bangladesh about this. In Bangladesh, four million women work in the garments industry, which is a pretty recent phenomena. This influx of female factory workers happened as a consequence of globalization. Now they live by themselves in the cities wearing hijabs in order to increase their mobility and gain a certain level of freedom to work in this very patriarchal society. If they do not wear hijab, the men in their neighborhood consider them as bad women and women who should be harassed. So strangely enough, the hijab is empowering these women in a very objectionable way. I'm not saying that all the women from different economic and social backgrounds are wearing hijabs for this reason, for the same reason, but this is a stark reality and serious issue for many working class women. Now, when we spe speak against the hijab and blame religion, though it is right to do so, don't we alienate these women? Why would they listen to us? The hijab has become an instrumental tool for their survival. Shouldn't we instead, instead blame the patriarchal society and the state which has failed to provide these women with the right, with the basic levels of security they require to go out in the world and work? Shouldn't we demand that, that the state provides that bas basic right to the women? In this sense, the hijab, a symbol of Islam cannot be viewed simply through the lens of religion. All this being said, I think religion cannot and should not be viewed only in an isolated framework. Religion cannot really survive in this extent without its, without its institutionalization or political sponsorship. Remember, 
Religion has existed in human society in many different forms for all of our recorded history and way before that. Where does religion get the self-sustaining power? From what we know so far, religion has begun as we started questioning the unknown natural world around us. Who makes the rainfall? Where does the sun go at night? Where do we come from? Where do we go after we die? Who causes the wrath of earthquakes, the tsunamis, the, the cyclones? Human societies quickly discovered a broader utility of this natural and supernatural belief system and established a symbiotic relationship between tribal rulers and the religious preachers. Politics try to control people's lives. What can be a better instrument to establish social control than religion? And as agricultural societies developed, we saw the idea of God king developing. A king mediating between the people on earth and the gods in heaven. These kings had absolute power over life and death, ensuring their role as the shepherd of their people. According to the sociologist Robert Bella, the hierarchical structure of political power was mirrored in the hierarchy of gods, which supported both theology and the cultic political status of the kings. The institutionalization of religion continued as we saw monotheism flourish in the last three or 4,000 years. And this institutionalization of religion is actually one of the main reasons that religion has survived so long. Christianity flourished after it was institutionalized by the Romans. Islam was a political religion from the get-go. And we are seeing now how, how Hindutva has gained strength in modern India under state sponsorship. More recently, it was very interesting to see Donald Trump select Saudi Arabia, the most fundamentalist Islamic society in the world, as his first state visit, and receiving the highest honor of the country with the, that ugly gold big necklace from the Saudi king. Trump receiving this honor is an American president who has insulted, criticized Muslims and banned residents of six Muslim majority nations from entering the US. But you know, this did not get in the way of a Saudi Trump love affair. And then at the end of the trip, what did we hear? Oh yes, they have signed the biggest arms deal, the largest arms deal in history with the $410 billion. We'll most probably see these weapons used in the countries like Yemen, where Shia and Sunni conflict between the Saudis and Iranians has been the cause of thousands of deaths. We all know the story of Russian invasion in Afghanistan and America and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan bankrolling the ta Taliban's to combat Russia. Would ISIS be this powerful if the US had not invaded Iraq? Or if Russia, America, Saudi Arabia, Iran, all of them had not fought for a peace for, of Syria? We have seen time and time again the secular Western governments do not mind tinkering with religion abroad when religion seems to be beneficial to their political cause. Let's consider Bangladesh for a moment, my home country, where my husband Ovijit Roy and I were attacked by the militant Islamic fundamentalists in 2015. Ovijit died, and I was left gravely injured. It took me three months just to reco recover physically. I'm actually going through PTSD treatment right now, after what, like 26 months? The democratically elected secular, so-called secular government of this Muslim majority nation stayed completely quiet for months while the militants killed atheist bloggers, publishers, secular intellectuals, uh, LGBT activists. When the government finally condemned these killings, they also arrested atheist bloggers, writers, and publishers under the Information Communication and Technology Act, infamously known as the ICT Act a very 
old British semi-blasphemy law, punishing people with up to 14 years of jail for criticizing religion. The Bangladeshi government has given in to many other demands from the Islamic fundamentalist groups. Believe it or not, this year they have decided to take out all the non, the text from the school curriculums of the non-Muslim intellectuals. The restrictions on the basic freedom of expression has gone to a new height in recent years in that country. I think that a country like Bangladesh might not have been able to turn towards religious fundamentalism so quickly in just last few decades if local, state, and federal governments had not systematically rehabilitated and sponsored Islamic political parties. If millions of dollars had not poured into Bangladesh from oil-rich Gulf countries like the Saudi Arabia and Qatar to establish madrasas and religious establishments instead of creating inclusive secular education system. Or if all those Afghan mujahideens trained in Islamic Ummah did not make their way back home and create all those Islamic militant groups in the country. I can go on and on, but I will stop right here and ask, in today's world, is it enough to just criticize religious doctrines, or should we also look at the political, social, and cultural enablers and sponsors who use religion every step of the way to achieve their own goals? With the, with the right conscience, should we try to look at it from a more holistic point of view? I think we need to do both. It cannot be either or. It has to be inclusive. We should criticize the Quran, rightfully so, for enabling ISIS to establish a caliphate with the values from the Dark Ages for committing the crimes like selling and raping the Yazidi women in open slave markets in this 21st century. At the same time, we must also call out the players like, like the patriarchal societies and the imperialist powers and local autocratic governments who directly and indirectly aided in creating ISIS. Otherwise, I really believe that the story remains incomplete. Thank you.